Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Investing from A to Z podcast. I'm your host, Steph Bodrini. We provide straightforward information by bringing excellent guests with real world experience in all topics related to commercial real estate investing. And in today's episode, we continue our conversation with Mike Morawski. He's the founder of My Core Intentions. And he went from building a $100 million company all the way to zero. And here are the top five lessons learned from that experience. Here we go. I'm very curious to dig deeper into these mistakes, each one of them, and how are you doing things differently today? So we can start with uh, maybe growing too fast. How slow is the ideal thing for you and, and why? And then we can jump into the other ones. Yeah, it's kind of funny because I catch myself sometimes wanting to go do something else. You know? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> kind of put the pause on looking, you know, not looking at deals because we're we're underwriting a, a whole bunch of deals right now, but we're not willing to pull the trigger yet because we're waiting to get a little bit more down the road on the stabilization. Bought our first deal. What we're doing is just kind of pause a little bit. We're in there doing capital improvements, turning some units. Let's get 25, 30% of the, the complex turned, re-engineered, and then let's go do the next one. Once we okay. know the stabilization process is under, underway, mm-hmm. so just walk cautiously. Whenever you walk into something, walk in with your eyes wide open. You yeah. Know? I think some, I think too often we walk into things with so much excitement and so much vigor and energy that we don't pay attention to the little things. And you got to take the blinders off and use your peripheral vision, you know? Yeah. You have to be incredibly well-organized and also have a team that is the best to perform the best for, for our investors. Moving on to the lawyer thing, which I'm really curious how you're figuring this out because I know that I don't know everything. And if I were to ask a lawyer for some advice, I would follow their advice and think that I'm doing the right thing. So have you implemented something around that? I've become the question guy. I've actually had people say, man, you ask way too many questions. And I say, well, it's because I'm curious and I also want to make sure I'm safe. So I don't think we should ever be afraid to ask questions. And I think we need to to fact check right? You went to the doctor and the doctor said you had cancer and you didn't think you did, or you thought you did. Wouldn't you go get a second opinion anyhow? Yeah. So I think it's the same thing in the legal profession. Um, Makes sense. You know, here, here's the problem. So what I did moving money between companies was not a crime, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Matter of fact, five years before I got indicted, the SEC would have come in would have uh, fined me $250,000, slapped me on the hand, told me to go back and straighten my business out and not let it happen again. But today they put you in prison for it. What the crime was, was non-disclosure because I didn't tell you, right? When you're held at that higher standard because you raise capital or because you have somebody else's best interest at hand because you're the fiduciary, you need to tell them everything. So transparency is more important today. Communication is more important today. More more investor calls, more newsletters, more written documentation, more pictures, more things that that the investor can't ever push back and say, well, I didn't know this. That's yeah. that's a great lesson there. And then in terms of vacancy, what was it before and what ended up being you know, during the crisis, uh, and I know you had many properties, you can totally generalize that. Yeah, I'll give you a portfolio overview, right? So we would buy properties that were typically low 80s, high 70s occupancy. People didn't want value add back then. You know, Got it. Hey, everybody loves it, right? So mm-hmm. we would buy these value add deals and we would turn them around. We actually had occupancy rates of the high 80s, low 90s, 92%, pretty much where we averaged. When 2008 rolled around, occupancies dropped back into the high 70s. And it was like overnight. And even yeah. some properties even further than that. I'll give you an example. I owned a deal in Anderson, Indiana. When we bought that property, 
Anderson, Indiana was rated on a list of 275 by Money Magazine, the number three city in the country to raise a family in. Bought that property. Within nine months, it was fourth from the bottom. It was like 271. Now here's why, okay? It was car industry centric. So they didn't make cars there, but what they made, they had all these little businesses that made knobs for radios, dashboard covers, beading for seats, springs for inside the seats. And those are the products that they sold to the car manufacturers. What were the industries that got hit the hardest in 2008? Automotive and transportation. And we were heavily vested in markets both like that. Hmm. As a result, businesses went out of business, people lost their job, people had to move. I had a property manager call me on a Monday morning from this property in Anderson in tears. And I'm like, Mary, what's wrong? And she says, I have 30 moving trucks in the parking lot this morning. This is a Monday morning, mind you. She goes, I don't have a scheduled move out for 45 days. How do you handle that? How do you weather that storm? You know, this goes back to being undercapitalized, didn't have enough money, right? We were over leveraged. So we had too much on the debt side and not enough on the reserve or equity side. And we couldn't pull capital. Now here's another mistake I made. And, and by the way, a- how many, how many years of reserve do you now try to get? Well, your lender wants you to have uh, typically about $350 per unit for a year. You want to have that money in reserves with the bank, right? To draw from if need be. I think that that's a pretty safe bet because that will typically take you, if you underwrite a deal at a 10 or 15% vacancy, and then you have an extra 5% in the bank, you should be able to weather the storm for a period of time. Okay. So here's the other thing that I did. And, and, you know, looking back, this was a, a really big mistake, but the market was so robust. I wanted to be competitive in the market as a syndicator and wanted investors to invest with us. So I took out of our PPM section that talked about capital calls. So if there was ever a problem and I wanted to come back to you and ask for capital because we had a problem with the property, I took that out because I thought that the market wouldn't change. Whoever saw a 40% correction coming in the marketplace, right? Nobody it's, saw the world closing for several months and some years in some locations yeah. during COVID. So sure. we all have to prepare for things like that. Yeah. So that was the other thing was just not paying attention to the details and the red flags. People see things. There's a great scripture in the Bible and it says that a wise man seeks much counsel. And so today I spent a lot of time talking to a lot of peers that are in the business you know, I always say, if you're the smartest one in the room, go to a new room <laughs> uh, because that's how you learn is by people smarter than you. So that's awesome. And so, you know, I have been saying this for ever since I started this podcast that I think there are a lot of people out there that are buying these deals at super low cap, highly leveraged. And if there's a little tiny dip, you know, not even close to the 40% that you had, that's it. Do you think that there is a lot of people going through this right now and a lot of people are in danger when something does happen to the economy in the near future or further future? It's hard to tell. And, you know, I think I have this conversation with someone every day. I have a very good friend who owns a mortgage company here in Chicago, and we were on the phone this afternoon. And he's been in the industry as long as I have. And he's built a very successful, very large mortgage company. And he said today, he goes, Mike, I I don't know what's going on. He goes, I I can't figure it out. People around me can't figure it out. He said, you would have thought by now that this market would have, would have stopped, but it keeps going up. Interest rates are going up. They hope they're thought they're going to offset it. They're going to print more money. They're going to put money in the marketplace, which is going to put a bandaid on it. And I'm not an economist, right? But how long can they continue to prop up what eventually is going to happen? I have um, uh, another friend that was one of the largest foreclosure attorneys in the country. They, They did the foreclosures for the bank side. 
So they represented four different servicers mm -hmm. that had residential foreclosures. And they did about 800 deals a month for about four years. Mm -hmm. We talked uh, about a few months ago and he said, I have no idea. He goes, my business is 15% of where it was at the peak. And he said, I think it's going to come back, but I don't know. So nobody really knows, right? Yeah. We see a lot of the same fundamentals and the same things that were going on in 2006, 2007, you know, 2008 rolled around and it was like, you know, somebody dug their heels in. Could it happen tomorrow? I imagine it could. Absolutely. Will it be as drastic? I don't think it'll be as drastic, Stephanie, mm. but I think that there's going to be somewhat of a correction that we're going to see. Just again, make sure your underwriting is very conservative. Don't inflate rent growth. Don't inflate cap rates. Don't underwrite for the sake of raising capital. Underwrite for the sake of the deal. It has to be math over emotion. Always, because what's the point of losing everything? Let's say you have 100 properties and you're doing these things versus being way more conservative and having 20 and not having to go through this when something hits the fan. So this has been wonderful, Mike. Is there anything else that you think we should have covered that our audience should know? Not about mistakes or, or, or things like that. I'd love to give away a copy of my book. People can go to my website and grab a copy of that. I actually have a couple of things there. I have a small ebook that's multifamily fundamentals, a small ebook about uh, the must ask questions for a real estate sponsor or a real estate deal. And then my book exit plan. So you could just go to my website at mycoreintentions.com forward slash free. And those are available. You could grab one or all of them if you want it. So thank you so much, Mike, for sharing all these incredible stories with us. I'm so proud of you for coming out of that. That is, <laughs> I don't think I would have survived. <laughs> Very incredible story. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it, Stephanie. And if you haven't already, we would really appreciate a review on the podcast app that you are using. As you guys know, each episode takes a full day worth of work to get completed from beginning to end. And we would really appreciate you sharing the love with us. And I will see you next time.